Helen Lau was out here looking for Candyman. You ask me, I say she found him. What's Candyman? The 1992 movie Candyman, directed and co-written by Bernard Rose, was based on a story by Clive Barker. Because it drew upon urban legends, it's a bit of a mishmash of largely unrelated ideas. The specter that appears when you speak its name in the mirror. Candyman. 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 The killer with the hooked hand. I hear you looking for Candyman, bitch. Well, you found him. And then there's the bees. What's blood for, if not for shedding? It all makes a sort of sense when you're provided the backstory of Daniel Robitaille, the ostensible source of the legend. He was a black man murdered for an affair with a white girl in 1870s Chicago, and the legend takes on the flavor of racial injustice. Graduate student Helen Lau braves the slums of Cabrini Green in search of present-day folk versions of the story. What she discovers is that the urban myth, as it were, helps people to frame situations they'd otherwise find too overwhelming to deal with. An entire community starts attributing the daily horrors of their lives to a mythical figure. The poverty and unlivable conditions are tied inexorably to the Candyman myth. In there. Candyman's in there? I've heard Charlie say so. A boy got killed there. As racial inequity abides, so too does his story. A local killer is murdering innocents in horrible ways. The Candyman did it. The worst part, the residents are afraid to call the police. A code of honor, perhaps. Fear of the police themselves. The easy answer is always Candyman did it. The summoning game itself could be connected. I mean, it's clear that no one person makes this up. This grew from the community's collective subconscious. A survival tool evolved from the need to protect itself and its children from the horrors of the community. It makes the senseless palatable, even intriguing. During the course of the film, Lyle inadvertently causes the Candyman to kill a number of people in her vicinity, such that it appears that she is doing the killings. As she unravels, the movie never forbids the viewer the possibility this may actually be the case. She may be inspired by the legend to kill in the name of the Candyman. But it is Tony Todd, who made this role iconic in the horror canon, who dominates the film. His combination of menace and pathos is compelling, and one wants to believe. Be my victim. Be my victim. The story resolves when Lau discovers that she can co-opt the Candyman story and make it her own. Your death will be a tale to frighten children, to make lovers cling closer in their rapture. Come with me and be immortal. <laughs> Robotai explains to her the power that the legend brings, and she changes the narrative, as it were, to make it about herself. She sacrifices her life to save that of an infant, a black child for a white woman. And this, in the context of the legend, brings amends and closure, and an apparent end to the Candyman and his rage. It's a movie that's not really satisfying in that the story, ostensibly about Candyman and the injustices suffered by African Americans, turns out to be the story of a white savior, a woman who comes to understand the power of the urban myth and render it her own. Oh, Helen. 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 Inescapably, this means taking it from the Candyman and those he represents as a black man wronged by the law. Yeah, but you know what bugs me about the whole thing? Two people get brutally murdered and the cops do nothing. Or as a white woman goes in there and gets attacked and they lock the place down. Along comes Candyman 2021. But it wasn't her. It was him. 
directed and co-written by Nia DaCosta, and produced and co-written by Jordan Peele. It isn't a remake. It's a sequel in every sense, maintaining and continuing the story of the original. Home sweet home. Ah, the more things change, the more things stay the same. Even placing an interesting spin on how the public received Lyle's story from the original movie. On the night of the annual bonfire, with all of the residents of Green watching, Helen arrives with a sacrificial offering. Baby in her arms, she runs towards the fire, but they're on her quick. They say she was in a, in a fugue state, fighting back blindly. But they got the baby free. While everyone is fussing over him, Helen stands up and walks right into the fire. In this version, though, we get a modified and more focused notion of exactly what the Candyman is. Candyman ain't a he. Candyman's the whole damn hive. It seems that due to the power of the story, there have been many who wore the Candyman mantle. All men horribly wronged by a racially biased system. William. William Burke. Anthony McCoy. Uh, you need a hand? This time, Anthony McCoy is an artist who, like Lyle, becomes obsessed with the Candyman myth and finds those around him being murdered, with himself as the obvious suspect. However, one scene in this film, which otherwise seems gratuitous and rather set apart from the main story, finds the Candyman killing a number of high school girls who attempt the name ritual for fun. This seems to fulfill only the purpose of assuring the audience that the Candyman does in fact exist, apart from McCoy, and that he and Lyle were not deluded killers, but in fact were, as presented, being haunted by the Candyman. But McCoy's Candyman is not Robitaille. It's a simpleton named Sherman Fields, who used to offer candies to the kids of Cabrini Green. Murdered by the cops on presumption of guilt in a razor candy scandal he was not responsible for. What shows up a couple weeks later? More razor blades and more candy. That's when we knew Sherman had been innocent. Harmless. But that wasn't the last we saw of him. Sherman's face was beaten so badly that it was unrecognizable. And that's where the story started. About them seeing him around Cabrini. About him coming to get you. Over time, his name disappears and he just becomes the Candy Man. It seems that Candy Man isn't an individual so much as a tradition. A hive, as it's described in keeping with the bee motif. Anyone can become the Candy Man if he's murdered unjustly out of racial hatred. And so the story becomes more firmly grounded as a race relations allegory. A story like that, a pain like that, lasts forever. Where the 2021 film falters, though, is in forgetting that the Candyman is an evil that does not discriminate. He will slaughter any who dare summon him, black or white, young or old. Candyman. The hatred and evil he represents is not directed by reason. It's the madness that is a consequence of pushing someone too far. In this respect, he is more akin to a riot than to an angel of vengeance. These are, after all, horror films. Candyman 2021 seems to forget that towards its closing. Although the film, in a sense, takes back the narrative for those victimized by racial injustice, we also get a Candyman that attacks police, rather than the woman who summoned him. It's an ending designed to satisfy the audience's sense of justice, rather than a horror ending. Ultimately, I think both films have flaws, but both offer enough horror movie fun and the iconic monster. Once it was finished, the city soon realized that there was no barrier between here and the Gold Coast. Unlike over there where you got the highway and the L train to keep the ghetto cut off. Exactly. And they offer something to consider by way of raising issues about neighborhood isolation and subsequent gentrification so that they are elevated above the standard horror film. Artists gentrify the hood. Who do you think makes the hood? The city cuts off a community and waits for it to die. They're both worth seeing, 
both a lot of fun. And even if some element of the film annoys some particular viewer as too political or not political enough, you have the consolation of Tony Todd creating one of modern horror's most iconic characters. Tell everyone. Thanks for watching. Please comment, share, like, and subscribe. Or, you know, shoot me.